what this means is that the wolf calling and maternal penning treatments from Soroya explain population dynamics of caribou no better than either habitat alteration or random chance alone. This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers brought to you by the Fur Bearers. British Columbia has ordered the killing of hundreds of wolves as part of their caribou recovery plan in recent years. Now you can hear more about the maternal penning, the ongoing habitat destruction, and this plan itself in episodes past. Today, we're going to talk about two studies. The first was a 2019 study which gave scientific support to killing wolves to protect the caribou, and despite widespread opposition, it largely became government policy. But this summer, a new paper was published that not only challenges the first study, but points to multiple flaws that may have contributed to the government-sanctioned killing of 463 wolves in the last year alone. The new paper, titled No Statistical Support for Wolf Control and Maternal Penning as Conservation Measures for Endangered Mountain Caribou, was published in the journal Biodiversity and Conservation this month. In it, the authors described the lack of a null model in the original paper as a major flaw, as well as a few other issues. This is a highly politicized issue with many factors. But truly understanding what the missing null model means and how it impacts the rest of the science, and ultimately the government policy, was difficult for me. That's why I reached out to Amelia Porter. Amelia is one of the Fur Bear's science advisors. As a registered professional biologist, Amelia works as an environmental scientist and has the skills, and let's be honest, the patience, to break down the complex science of these cull-related studies. She joined Defender Radio to review the two primary studies involved in this latest conversation and why we should be pushing the government to follow the latest science to protect both caribou and wolves. We've also got one extra bit that didn't make it into our interview, so hang on after the full interview to hear more. If you're a wolf lover, and I know a whole bunch of you are, I'd love for you to head to animalstone.com and meet Biko. He's the beautiful wolf charm made with ethically sourced, frequently recycled materials by the family-owned Animal Stone Company. They make gorgeous jewelry inspired by animals and give back to the animals they represent. A portion of proceeds from purchases of Biko, the wolf charm, go to Paws and Jaws, an organization that works on conservation issues, as well as giving long-term homes to dogs, cats, and oft-abused wolf dogs. Visit AnimalStone.com to see Biko and other timeless, wearable art that showcases beautiful animals with texture and life in each and every charm. Remember that using promo code DefenderRadio gets you 10% off, and it helps the podcast a bit too. That's animalstone.com and promo code Defender Radio. This is a very broad issue. I've done many episodes on it. And there's elements of this whole caribou wolf thing that still don't make sense to me. Uh, right. But for the sake of this conversation, I'd like to start with what's the uh, sort of a narrow talk on what the, fo- the, the problem is, what's the past study, which to my understanding, has more or less become policy, says. And then what this new one says, because a lot of it involves math, and math is hard. Yes. <laughs> um, which is why we turn to brilliant scientists like yourself. Uh, so if we want to start with with the basics, there's caribou, there's wolves, the government wants to do something, here we are. How would you lay that out for someone new to this issue? In simple terms, I guess. Right. So... Basically, um, the caribou conservation crisis is a result of habitat destruction. Mm-hmm. Um, so woodland caribou are specialists. Um, that means they rely on lichen-rich old-growth um, forests um, as lichen are their primary food source. Um, so industrial logging, oil and gas, as well as as well as recreational activities, have resulted in direct loss of caribou habitat. So this means that 
the altered land is not capable of supporting caribou. Um, so the urgency of the issue now is dire. Uh, in BC, caribou have declined from approximately 40,000 in 1900s to approximately 15,000 today. Uh, and a number of caribou herds have already become extirpated, meaning they've become locally extinct in BC and unfortunately more are destined to do so as well. So it's kind of a, a scramble for researchers and regulators to find solutions to the problem. Mm -hmm. So um, loss of critical habitat is the ultimate cause, but the altered land also leads to another problem which only compounds impacts to the caribou. The cleared land creates early seral forests, which are more open, early successional vegetation and shrub habitat. And this type of habitat is preferred by moose, elk, and deer. So these species, moose, elk, and deer, particularly moose, are primary prey species for wolves. Mm -hmm. So these primary prey species move into the more open land through logging roads, seismic lines, um, and snow-packed snow -packed trails. Um, and that then the wolves follow their primary prey. So uh, what you have is the wolves have access to the caribou, and this is what's understood now as human-mediated wolf predation. So essentially the wolves become they're, sorry, essentially the, the caribou become the wolves bycatch. Mm. Um, so this, this process is termed um, apparent competition, which is between the abundant primary prey and the enda endangered woodland caribou. And so it's widely agreed upon by all parties that wolf predation is not the underlying reason why caribou are declining, caribou are declining due to the loss of critical caribou habitat. And it's interesting because I, I, this really needs to be added into this conversation. The, the information that the government has collected on this shows that. This is right. not, you know, a surprising revelation. This is not unknown information or only one side agrees to Everyone agrees that habitat destruction and changing the landscape has got us to here. And that exactly. ultimately, we've got to figure out a way to change course on that. Right. But that, yeah, so. that, that's got some <laughs> economic uh, impacts, I suppose, is maybe the mildest way to put that. Exactly. Um, so... So due to the urgency of the issue, the BC government has undertaken an intensive wolf control program, which was implemented in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, so for a while now, I've been trying to think of a good analogy to kind of summarize the issue and what's happening. And Michael, you can tell me what you think of this, but um, let's say you have a bucket and um, there's a group of people kicking around the bucket. Um, and they're causing damage to the bucket. And eventually a hole forms in the side of the bucket. Now, in order to preserve the function of the bucket and keep the water retained inside, somebody has to put their finger over the hole. Mm -hmm. And they, keep their, they have to keep their finger there in order to keep the water inside the bucket. In the meantime, uh, the bucket can be continued you can continue to kick the bucket around and continue damaging the bucket. Um, and so what happens is the overall integrity of the bucket um, becomes weakened over time even more. And if the if somebody releases their hole off the finger, then or sorry, the finger off the hole, then the water is going to um, be released. Mm -hmm. But because somebody's holding their finger there, um, the bucket maintains function and as I said, the, it, the integrity becomes weaker over time and, um, it's still fulfilling its, its, uh, function and, um, and they're able to, uh, keep damaging the bucket. And that's kind of, 
do you follow here? here yeah, no, you? I was I was just thinking I, I while I, I personally struggle with kicking the bucket, that's something I'm working on in therapy. Um, <laughs> I think that that is a very good example. It's a great analogy. And it, it is ultimately and that's the frustrating part is watching someone try and keep their thumb over that hole in the bucket while, you know, oil and gas just kind of go, hey, guys, and hoof at it once and go, all right, we'll be back in a bit uh, and come back. <laughs> like it's, right. it, it, it's, it's a very frustrating thing to watch happen, uh, right. especially in real time with very, very real stakes. Right. So, yeah, the habitat destruction can continue as long as uh, that's being maintained, and that's why they're they have this intensive wolf call happening. Yeah, and it, there's a there's a lot of politics going on behind this, and there's a lot of really interesting writing that's been done on this that really provides insight into the the actual politicking. Uh, I I don't think that's the correct verb but it's the one i'm using um <laughs> and just putting emphasis and confidence behind it to make it sound better uh i may have undercut myself there but anyway uh there are very complex local issues at stake as well because of some of the i would argue oversimplification of some of these issues by some people involved so for example um, I know there was one about, a, I, I believe it was the logging industry in one specific town, more or less said, like, if they make a stop, this town is going under, so we have to kill the wolves. That's kind of what the right. message ended up being. Um, right, exactly. So this, this, this is playing out on sort of a national stage, but also very intensely locally. We're not going to get into that. I, I think I've spoken about that with some people. I Again, I have spoken a lot about this issue and can't remember all of the, the details, but definitely look those up. And that brings us around to this Atlantic article. Uh, this is arguably, I think this is the most complete article on the issue uh, as it stood when this new uh, study came out, uh, I think it's dated yeah. July 14th, and I'll, I'll share the link in the show notes uh, for those who would like to read it. More or less, though, new information came out that points to the original information that says it's not great. Um, exactly. <laughs> that's my massive oversimplification for the day. Uh, but let's talk about the first study. So this is the one, uh, Saving Endangered Species Using Adaptive Management, that was, uh, I think, actually published March of 2019, but submitted October 2018, not uncommon, um, by a, a large group of researchers. Uh, could you right. summarize for us the the concepts at play in this original, uh, I think it was, is, is his last name Soroa? He's the, the lead author. Yeah, not, Soroya, Soroya. Soroya. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I apologize for that. I actually looked it up and couldn't find anything. I think it's Soroya. Okay. Soroya, Soroya, um, Roya. Well, yeah, apologies so, to you, sir. <laughs> so, yeah, doctors, uh, the article was published, um, as you said, in uh, March 2019 uh, by Dr. Soroya and colleagues from the University of Guelph, University of Northern BC. University of Montana, and as well as conservation and natural resource government agencies in both BC and Alberta. Mm -hmm. um, so I can give a summary of what they did. Um, the theme of their paper was adaptive management. Adaptive management is a process commonly used to manage ecosystems by testing and learning. Here, the authors intended to apply its uh, its use for recovering endangered species. So basically adaptive management means making management decisions as an iterative process by making different types of interventions, each only in specific areas and testing their effectiveness by comparing to each other and to similar areas where no interventions have occurred. Mm -hmm. So in managing woodland caribou, the authors, authors use mathematical model, models to assess the effectiveness of different management practices that have been implemented, including the reduction of predators such as wolves, reductions of primary prey such as moose, translocations, and maternal penning. To test the success of the different management interventions, 
they measured lambda, which in ecology is a fancy term for annual population growth. They compared population growth between the different areas where intervention had occurred. These areas are called treatments and also compared each of the treatments to control areas where no management inter interventions had been implemented. This was done on population data, uh, data across large, or sorry, done with, based on population data across large spatial scales. So they selected 18 caribou populations, mainly in British Columbia and some in Alberta as well. Um, and these populations spanned four recognized caribou ecotypes. Um, those four ecotypes are known as the boreal caribou ecotype, northern mountain caribou, central mountain caribou, and southern mountain caribou ecotypes. Of the 18 caribou populations selected for the study, 12 of these were treatments, that's with, with interventions, and six were controls. The authors specified that they only chose six control populations to best match ecological conditions as closely as possible to the treatment populations. So now talk a bit about what they found. Um, before the treatments were implemented, 16 of 18 populations were in decline. After treatments began, six of 12 treated population showed stable or increasing population growth. None of the control populations had positive population growth during treatments. The authors found the greatest population growth occurred where combinations of, a treatment, of treatments or multiple recovery strategies were applied simultaneously. Um, they also determined that the degree of ecosystem alteration as measured by early cereal forest cover did not explain variation in changes to population growth. And one of the main takeaways highlighted throughout the paper was that treatments must be applied intensively to produce a measurable effect. So for example, wolf calling can't be done in low numbers. Mm -hmm. A large portion of the population must be killed. And currently we know that the target goal of the wolf call program more recently is 85%. So um, the implications of this research, um, the authors suggested population management as an emergency measure to avoid further extrap extirpation of caribou populations. Particularly, they suggested lethal wolf control and maternal caribou penning as the most effective methods. And this paper had profound Im implications because it was relied upon by the BC government, as you said, and was influential to forming the basis for increasing the intensity of the wolf call. Since inception of the wolf call program in 2015, over 1,000 wolves have been killed by aerial gunning, of which 463 of those wolves were shot from helicopters just in the last year alone. So that's a bit of a summary of, of uh, what they did and what they found and the implications of the, the research in 2019. It should be noted that Pacific Wild has launched legal action against the government, specifically over the methods being used by the government contractors. We've written about that at thefurbears.com and hopefully we'll have more on it soon as well. Um, that is not related, though, to this new study that has come out. Um which it, I, I guess, I mean, sort of, I, I've read it. I've read the study numerous times. I'm not a scientist, as we all know, so I struggle with some of the in-depth issues. But the, the general thing I took away from it is someone didn't do something in the original work which has a lasting impact on the result. Right. That's two massive oversimplifications for today, by the way. <laughs> That's a, basically summarizes it. <laughs> but when we actually talk about science, what does it say? Again, this is it's um, this was another study. It got published uh, Biodiversity and Conservation just recently. Uh, yeah, fourteen July. Um, uh, for our American listeners, that's July fourteenth. 
Um, so what was this one about? What, what did they set out to accomplish, do you think, and what did they show? Okay, so this recent study published uh, was published by Dr. Lee Harding et al. from the University of British Columbia, University of Alberta, and University of Victoria. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just want to say for the rest of the discussion, I'll refer to the two articles by the lead authors, so Soroya and Harding. Um, to summarize what they did, Harding, so Harding reevaluated the same data and findings of Soroya through a critical statistical lens by drawing on the principles of strong inference. They deemed that the work of Soroya warranted close examination considering the policy implications and cost of error. So their work shifts the focus toward the influence of varying ecotypes. Throughout the paper, Harding refers to the southern mountain caribou instead as deep snow mountain caribou, as other researchers have also done in the past. This is because of their distinctive ecological and behavioral characteristics. Boreal, northern, and central ecotypes forage on ground-dwelling lichen that are easily accessible due to relatively uh, relatively shallow snow depths. And southern mountain caribou, or deep snow, the deep snow ecotype, on the other hand, must rely on lichen only found from old growth trees due to snow depths of three to four meters, which they access atop the snowpack. So this makes deep snow mountain caribou distinctive from the other um, ecotypes. So I'll summarize a bit about what, um, what they found in Harding. Mm-hmm. Um, so the authors of the recent article outlined five major issues pertaining to study design and statistical practices. I'll outline each of these flaws identified and evaluated by Harding. So first, the most serious issue they point out is that Soroya did not report the results of a null model which performs equally as well as the treatments. So what is a null model? A null model sets the baseline. It evaluates the background conditions to help have a better understanding of the constant parameters for a particular population. The null model represents what would be expected to occur in the absence of a particular mechanism. So in this case, what can we expect to see for caribou population growth without any predictors such as wolf calling. Including a null model is standard practice in order to determine if a pattern truly exists or if it could be a better, or if it could be better attributed simply to random chance. A null model is based on randomization to determine if the existence of a pattern is the result of random processes. Deviations between the null model and other models that have predictors can be can then be compared. So Soroya failed to consider the scenario of random chance in their modeling, the null model. So it could be possible that random chance alone could explain the changes observed in caribou population growth. Harding ran a null model and found that when including this null model, there was little difference from the other models that considered management intervention or habitat alteration. The difference was so small that it was not considered a statistically significant difference. So what this means is that the wolf calling and maternal penning treatments from Soroya explain population dynamics of caribou no better than either habitat alteration or random chance alone. Harding took it a step even further to find out what could better explain change in population growth. They knew that there are differences in behavior and habitat use among ecotypes, as I described earlier. So they evaluated some additional model scenarios that considered caribou ecotypes. They thought it's plausible that the intrinsic characteristic differences in ecotypes could explain the change in caribou population growth. What is profound here is their finding that the ecotype model outperformed all others, 
with meaningful differences between the northern mountain and central mountain caribou, as well as between the deep snow mountain and central mountain ecotypes. This means that ecotype accounted for more variation in caribou population growth than did wolf calling or maternal penning treatments, habitat alteration, and random chance. Ecotype was the strongest indicator of caribou population growth. So that basically summarizes uh, their first point um, of omitting the null model. Yeah, and that, is there a reason, and this, I'm not asking about their intent, I can't ask you about their intent, but as someone involved in this world, is it normal? Is it unusual? Uh, how does this leaving out the null model, which in my brain kind of translates to a sort of control, um, you know, is that something that you would see generally in this kind of work? Generally, you would see inclusion of a null model. Um, it's important to evaluate and understand what would happen um, with the population or what could happen if there were no, um, no driver, no particular mechanisms or um, no treatments. Mm -hmm. So it, it's something we would expect to see and that it's not there alone is notable. And then the fact that the null model performs reasonably as well or arguably as well as the other models they created really highlights some issues with going forward with those models, I presume. Exactly. Okay. Um, yeah. And then what, what was the second part that you wanted to talk about? So the second issue they point out is that the study design was not balanced. Uh, wolf reduction treatments were drawn from the central mountain ecotype and boreal, and boreal population, whereas the six controls were drawn from deep snow mountain caribou, northern mountain, and central mountain ecotypes. So most of the treatments were from the central mountain ecotype. Treatments and controls aren't distributed evenly or even represented in some ecotypes. This is all despite the fact that Sora State's controls were selected based on matching ecological conditions as closely as possible to the treatment populations. But as you've said, they simply don't match. Exactly. That, that there's similarities, but it, it truly is apples and oranges. They are both fruit. They are both orbs. But beyond that, we've got a right. lot of differences that set them apart. Exactly. They just, they don't match and they're, they're spread over the different ecotypes. Um, but some exist, uh, treatments may exist in some ecotypes and not in the others and same with controls. So from a, a scientific point of view, um, and again, not asking you for conjecture or anything. When this happens, what is the appropriate next step? So someone publishes a statement that says, my math shows A. Someone else comes up and says, well, my math shows B. How do we sort of deal with this situation, I guess, now? Because we've got two groups of people who... I would, again, this is an assumption on my part, and I think one that is challenged a lot these days by the public, but you've got two groups of experts um, who are using the same data set and coming to different conclusions. How do we as the public deal with that situation? So when making decisions, regulators must consider the weight of evidence. And more importantly, they need to consider the best available research. So I think um, they, the regulators and um, decision makers need to take the recent findings of Harding into consideration and decide how that translates to management practices. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, it, it again, I would hope that it causes pause um, in terms of how things get done. Uh, especially if this is this policy from what I have read has more or less translated or sorry, the study has translated into policy. Um, so if we found flaw in the, you know, in, in the study, we are finding flaw in the policy and 
the precautionary principle would say to let's back off until we figure this out. Exactly. Yes, policymakers will need to seriously consider the findings and ask, are we doing the right thing here? Uh, and we know policymakers are great at doing that. <laughs> Uh, now, one of the things that came up, so I, I like many people who are involved in this, I, I lean on others to help inform my opinions and my beliefs because I don't have a fully technical understanding of some of this. Uh, and that's just life. Uh, but when I was reading this Atlantic article that we've been speaking of, um, they reached out um, to... I think more or less sort of say, hey, this is the new information. Um, and they were, uh, uh, Sar Saroa wrote back in an email. I'll just read the paragraph. That's easier. But the Saroa, okay. the lead author of the 2019 paper, the solutions proposed, including the wolf cold, make logical sense. In some of the caribou populations he examined, wolf culling or maternal penning did lead to population growth. Quote, the main point of the rebuttal relies on a statistical argument, whereas ours relies more so on logic, he told me in an email, <laughs> adding that both papers shared the mission of understanding how to save mountain caribou. Now, I read that as something of a layperson. And in my mind, logic and statistical uh, arguments kind of are the same thing. Yes. <laughs> so, I, 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 again, I can't ask you to read minds, but could you read a mind for me here? Yeah, I tr first I tried to think about, okay, what does he mean by that? And then I tried to think about what, um, what is he trying to mean by that? Mm -hmm. um, and... The only thing I can think of is um, he, it's, it sounds like by saying logic, um, it sounds like predetermined assumptions. Um, yeah. That might be going a little far, but um, that's the only thing I could come up with. Yeah. I, when I look at the, I, I wonder like, does he mean it relies more so on the logic of this showing that it works? Like it, 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 I don't know. It, it again, I, I look at it and I want it to make sense. I get frustrated when things don't make sense to me. Um, right. And you get relentless phone calls from me. So <laughs> trying to understand, whereas ours relies more so on logic, is he stating that because wolf culling or maternal penning did lead to population growth? Um, it, it, the statistical argument is less important. Is is that the attempt? I, I just, I don't, I'm going to see if I can reach out via email and get a comment, but I have been struggling with this paragraph. Yeah, I thought about it for a while and uh, it would be good to know what you find out. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we'll have something to add relatively shortly to this episode. Um, <laughs> but again, I, I think I, a general question, uh, genuinely, uh, and I won't use this as an example, uh, this came up a couple of times when I was a journalist and I struggled with it then, is how to present two conflicting pieces of information that come from experts who were using the same data set. Uh, what is the most rational way to deal with that outside of science? So as a reader of the news, I think maybe more so, when we've got two groups telling us two different things, can we accept that two different solutions exist or that two different outcomes exist from the same math or how do we deal with that again it just feels very frustrating as right. someone stuck between sort of two groups of people so this happens all the time in science whether it's two conflicting articles um, with different data or whether it's uh, conflicting articles that both use the same data and were evaluated differently um it, overall, it's important to consider to consider the weight of the evidence. So you need to take uh, multiple um, scientific articles um, into account and weigh them all. And you need to look at um, not only the results of those articles, but how they were carried out and um, do they meet all the statistical evaluation criteria um, and look at the study design and just overall simply look at how well the data was evaluated, um, the quality of the data, things like that. Um, and then you 
So basically you decide whether you believe the article or not. Um, and then you take all the ones that make sense and that are believable and you weigh them and see what direction um, they are steering in basically. So what, see what um, the overall consensus is between the articles. Um, unfortunately here, uh, we don't have that much research and the situation is so dire that we need to do something. So um, any evidence is really exciting or any findings um, that something might work is really exciting. And I think that's what happened with the Soroya article. A lot of people got very excited about it because it was a possible solution. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, uh, you need to consider everything. And like I say, evaluate how each article or how, how each data, how the data was evaluated and how um, both studies were carried out. Well, and I think at this point, it is also worth noting um, that from, again, this is pulling from that Atlantic article and kudos to who wrote it, Sabrina Imbler, uh, exceptionally well done. And it's been very helpful to me personally and many others, I'm certain, but uh, they note that from 2014 to 2019, 350 square miles of crucial deep snow caribou habitat have been lost to logging, according to another study, uh, which will also be linked. For context, again, I'm not sure. It's it's hard to evaluate, and I've been reading a lot about how we present numbers and social change to people and how our brains aren't really wired for these massive numbers. But uh, 350 square miles translates to unless you're super good at this you're not good 906 square kilometers how's where you're going to beat me in google um <laughs> with conversion so that's 906 square kilometers for reference the mega city of toronto is 600 some odd square kilometers so that is at least 30 percent more than toronto has been uh lost like uh, it's difficult to accept the scope of that while yeah, the huge. government saying we've got to help, we've got to help, we've got to protect them. They allowed that much land to be taken from the habitat, um, which then sort of brings up the question of despite all of this science pointing to the fact that that's going on, they're still arguing over whether or not we should kill wolves. And that sort of pushes us into a philosophical conversation, which is interesting. Um, and we can go on a huge tangent about that, but I don't think we did that in our brief, so we probably shouldn't. Um, but it's just, it's a very, I don't know. It's I, I, every time I read about this situation, every time I read about the science involved in this situation, I feel very frustrated as someone who fully understands the depth of this. And you can probably look forward more than we can uh, as non-scientists, how do you manage that frustration? How do you sort of, ju or uh, again, how do you deal with it? I guess that, that's the question. I'm trying to think of a smarter, more eloquent way to put that, um, but I can't. It is frustrating, I guess. Um, as a scientist, I just try to read everything I can. Um, and learn more about it and speak up as much as I can. Um, and that can be done in various ways. It can be done through writing. Um, it can be done through volunteering. Uh, it can be done through contacting politicians. Just keep pushing as much as you can um, and just hope for change. And it's also very important to talk to podcasters about it. Exactly. <laughs> That's almost it for this week, folks. But before we move on to thanks and credits, I wanted to include a short update from Amelia that she emailed me after our interview. These are from her notes. The third issue raised by Harding is that more than half of the populations in the study area were omitted and not discussed. Uh, Soroa only used 18 of 42 mountain caribou populations in the study area. The 24 excluded populations included those which had management interventions and nine populations which became functionally extinct during this study. Population data were available for all four populations representing treatments and controls. 
Harding highlights using several examples that, strangely, a number of the population trajectories of the excluded populations would contradict the inference made in Soroa's paper. So, for some of the excluded populations with treatments, population growth declined during or after the treatments, which includes wolf cull, wolf sterilization, and moose reduction, while areas that would be considered controls increased in population growth. These omitted populations would have allowed for a more comprehensive analysis of adaptive management approaches, but they were not even acknowledged. There you have it. If you want more information on this contentious subject, please visit the show notes for this week's episode wherever you listen or head to thefurbears.com. Links to all of the studies and news articles we mentioned are provided, and there's a whole lot more writing about the wolf cult at thefurbears.com. I want to thank Amelia not just for taking the time to talk to me, but to review all the materials and provide a complete picture of the contention between these two papers. I also want to thank our lovely sponsor, Animal Stone, for their ongoing support. Remember to visit AnimalStone.com and use promo code DefenderRadio to get 10% off your order. And I want to thank all of you for listening. I love hearing what you want episodes focusing on, so head over to my social at Defender Radio on Facebook and Twitter, or Howie Michael on Instagram to let me know. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bears, reminding you to be kind and to stay informed and stay strong. Defender Radio.